Uh, this is uh, what we call the Sutherland Farm, and uh, this is where we we have uh, about 20 acres, or, well, maybe 30 acres a year, where we do breeder seed production and also uh, research plot work in the breeding program for peas, uh, lentils, and fava bean. Dr. Bert Vandenberg is a professor and plant breeder at the Crop Development Center, which is part of the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. For many years now, he has worked with pulse crops, which are edible legumes like lentils and field peas. On this late July day, he's showing us some plots of faba beans on the university's research farm. Faba beans were first grown on the prairies quite a few years ago. Well, faba beans was first introduced in the prairies in the early 80s. Uh, people did some studies and it kind of started to grow and then the market never really took off. But our perception of how to market in those days was much different. We were just coming off, I don't know, 70 years of uh, cereals and summer fallow and you know, even canola wasn't that big then. So um, it eventually, there were, there were a couple of breeding programs and they both stopped because the, the marketing of the crop was difficult. Uh, that Things have changed. People are, there's, we've got three billion more people. There's a lot more demand for protein. And so the reevaluation re of faba bean as a crop, even on a global scale, not just Western Canada, is changing very rapidly. Um, it essentially didn't grow much in the last 40 years all around the world. But suddenly there's a interest in many countries because of nitrogen fixation, because of protein. So it's going to fit into the ecosystem. One of the biggest advantages a crop of faba beans has over other legumes is the fact that its seeds consist of about 32% protein, which is 50% more than crops like lentils and peas. What really distinguishes faba bean from the other pulses as well is the root system. You can see there's a tap root, and uh, you can see some nodules there. This crop is, the, is well known to be uh, an excellent nitrogen fixer. Kind of makes sense. If you've got 32% protein, that means more nitrogen is required, so the plant actually can supply its own needs. And so when you have faba bean stubble left behind or faba bean residue, you're going to have more protein, uh, sorry, more uh, nitrogen in your crop rotation as well. Uh, crop stands up. You can see the, the uh, how it's uh, structured here, you t typically with, uh, if you get faba beans off to a reasonable start, and you know, th this is about average height crop, you're gonna you can even leave some stubble, trap some snow. So that's kind of a unique feature. Most of our other pulse crops are uh, getting kind of flat by the time you're picking them up in some years. Faba bean is well suited for areas of western Canada where high moisture levels during the growing season causes problems with lentils and field peas. Faba bean is uh, quite taller in a soil moisture. As a matter of fact, that's, that's driving some of the interest in this crop. Number one, uh, we've seen situations in very wet years, faba bean does fantastically because it can tolerate uh, wet soils, it can tolerate uh, standing water a lot better than our pulses, uh, other pulses that we grow. And we've seen uh, situations where you know, people get a cloud burst in June and the water was actually flowing across the landscape for a week and the faba bean crop still maintains itself and continues to take off once the, once the standing water is gone. Uh, so very, very tolerant of, uh, of water. And the other thing that comes with water in the last few years, we've seen a lot of root rot, particularly something called the Phanomyces root rot. Uh, that has been real, putting real pressure on pea and lentil crops. Faba bean is actually tolerant of the disease, unlike pea and lentil. So as a rotational situation, it's, a, it's a very beneficial. Traditionally, faba bean varieties have been fairly large seeded. However, in recent years, Vandenberg and his colleagues have released small seeded varieties, which makes faba beans much easier to work with during seeding. This is a small seeded variety. Uh, typically, faba beans can range in size from a little bit smaller than this right through to like huge ones that are bigger than, bigger than my, that size of my thumb, really, the vegetable types. So, um, we, we, have been breeding to reduce the seed size so that anyone on the prairies can just use a regular air drill. Same, same machine you use for cereals and canola, you can also use for faba bean now that the seed size is down to where it's manageable. So it really looks like a large pea now. We've been visiting with Dr. Bert Vandenberg with the University of Saskatchewan's Crop Development Center. 
recent years, he's been developing and releasing varieties that are more suitable for Canadian farming conditions. We have a standard trial system. We use, uh, this, this, we use typically three row plots and uh, we try to evaluate large numbers. We're really trying to identify you know, populations of, uh, let's say, families that, uh, of <coughs> sister lines that uh, have high yield potential and have the uh, kind of agronomic qualities we want. We're trying to, we like to keep them short with as many pods as possible. Uh, small seed size is very important. We think that's going to be a key feature in faba beans. Um, in this particular nursery, everything is what we call zero tannin. Uh, so the colors are, or the flower color is pure white and the seed coats have no tannins in them, there's no polyphenols. Um, that's a, there's a, can be a little bit of a trade-off with, with agronomy, but we're trying to overcome that through breeding. Uh, it's important from the standpoint of the nutritional value. Um, we, we find that with, uh, with these lighter colored seeds that the fiber from the seed coat can be used in the human edible market. Uh, it also increases the amount of fiber as we reduce this, the, the seed coat size, and that allows us to um, produce more edible fiber uh, in the dehulling process. We are also looking at protein quality, of course. Uh, we grow them in isolation because <coughs> this crop has a slight amount of, um, the, the bees like it, uh, so they'll cross-pollinate it, so we can tolerate it within the market class. Uh, but we like to keep this isolated from, let's say, the ones that are destined for the Middle East, the larger seeded ones. We grow those at a completely different location so that we don't get the two mixing together. Meanwhile, back at the U of S's Crop Science Field Lab, we saw firsthand how faba beans come in various sizes and colors. Basically, large seeded and small seeded faba beans. This is the traditional type that we're always eating in the Middle East. Uh, for instance, this is the kind of things that people prefer in Egypt where they make, you know, they basically have faba bean as a breakfast dish or they make it as a soup. It can be eaten as splits or it can be eaten whole. They make different, uh, if you've ever had falafel, you probably have had some faba beans in there. Uh, on this side, we kind of have the newer style. So the th these, these three are, uh, you can see there's a progression in seed size. We're trying to get small. Uh, these are what we call zero tannin. So the polyphenol content of the seed coat and of the plant is, uh, is a lot less. That has some implications for when you dehull, you'll get nice white fiber products off of this. This, this is a small seeded type which was developed here uh, by someone who's now retired here, but they selected these as small for many, many years and we were able to then use this to develop the germplasm base for this type of product. This has its own uh, specialty market, let's say. Um, we find that at the, in Saskatchewan, I understand there's about a million acres of organic production of crops. Uh, so, you know, wheat and, uh, and some pulses and so on. Well, <coughs> when you grow organically, you have to grow your nitrogen the year before because you're not adding fertilizer, you're not adding pesticides. So we're, we've been promoting this as a means of producing your nitrogen the year before. Uh, and it kind of makes sense. You're going to have a lot more nitrogen fixation in the southern prairies, you can even let them, maybe not even harvest the grain, see late and let them trap snow. Now you've got the dual benefit of nitrogen fixation and, and moisture. This, this is where we're going to continue to head. We want to go as round as possible. Uh, we have some faba bean types, not, they're not represented here, but they're just as round as peas. Most people can't tell the difference if they're not uh, a plant scientist. Chris Meyerly heads up Greenleaf Seeds, a pedigreed seed and commercial grain operation near Tisdale, Saskatchewan. He says they moved into faba bean production mainly because of the challenges associated with field pea production in recent years. Uh, the last uh, five to ten years we've had a lot of issues trying to grow a pulse, a pulse crop in our rotation with peas. It's been very, very wet and uh, a lot of root rot issues in our peas and so yields have been down from where they have been. Um, we really believe that pulses are a good part of our rotation. We like what, how, they, how our soil comes out after a season, the extra nitrogen boost we get out of a pulse crop. So we were looking for something else. So I don't know, probably 10, 12 years ago, we tried a faba bean. Um, just didn't think they were quite there for the varieties for this area. 
So we kind of left it, and four years ago we got back into fava beans, as we said, looking for something else in our rotation. And uh, some of these newer varieties now, they seem to be a little bit shorter for days of maturity. Uh, they're a little smaller in size, so they're a little easier to handle. Um, and so we, we started with, a, I don't know, probably 10 or 12 acres four or five years ago, and, and then you know up to as much as 2,200 acres the last couple of years. It is mid-October and Chris's dad, Irwin, is combining a crop of the older Tabor variety of faba beans. The variety being harvested here has a larger seed size. It is also a tannin variety, which means it's destined for mostly the human food market. Most of the faba beans out there are probably anywhere from that like 98 to 110 days maturity. So they kind of indeterminate growth. They like to keep growing if you have a nice uh, long, warm harvest like we did here in 2015. They like to stay green a little longer. Um, we definitely let, we definitely desiccate them to try and speed up the dry down process. And so that usually happens somewhere around the 15th to the 20th of September. And then harvest usually happens a couple of weeks after that. As has been mentioned, plant breeders have managed to come up with varieties with a smaller seed size to make them easier to handle, especially at planting time. Some growers, including Chris, have found that the larger seed size associated with a variety like Tabor can cause bridging in the air drill seed tank, disrupting the flow of seed to some openers. This can cause some seed misses, which becomes evident at harvest time, where you can see the volunteer canola manage to pop up instead. But in spite of the small strips of seed misses, in this particular field, the faba beans ended up yielding a healthy 56 bushels to the acre. In that particular field, the, the variety we seeded there were about 480 grams per thousand, so they're a lot, a larger size. And uh, we had, we're trying to seed a heavier rate, obviously. We were trying to seed a little over three bushels an acre, and we had a few issues with our drill in that field where they were bridging in the tank and not one to, to come out. And so that can be an issue with faba beans, especially if the bigger they are, they, the slower you have to go. We traditionally will slow down one to one and a half miles an hour slower than what we normally would go, so three and a half to four miles an hour to seed our faba beans. And uh, we like to seed them around an inch and a half deep, probably is what we're trying to aim for, but that can be an issue. Obviously, the bigger they are, the harder they are to go through the airlines and through the, through the seeding meters. Since Greenleaf Seeds is a pedigreed seed operation, the grain cleaner is always running also means that farmers like Chris get a first-hand crack at growing newly released varieties. The one he's looking at here is one of the more recently released varieties developed by Dr. Bert Vandenberg and his helpers at the Crop Development Center in Saskatoon. This, uh, this particular variety here that we're looking at is uh, Snowdrop, Snowdrops. These are a zero tannin variety. They're uh, a smaller seed. There's very there's a lot of different sizes of fava beans anywhere. These are probably one of the smallest ones out there. They'd be about 330 grams per thousand in their weight. And there's fava beans that go all the way up to about 680 to 700 grams per thousand. So they're quite a, they'd be quite a bit larger than these ones, obviously, maybe two times the size. So this being a zero tannin, that means there's, there's no tannin in the seed coat of these, of these beans. And so they fit well into a human consumption market as well as they fit it into a feed market very well. Um, hogs can't handle a tannin in their diet. Okay. Thus far, Chris says they have not seen a lot of disease or insect pressure on the faba beans, but they are still being vigilant on that front. Chocolate spot is a disease that uh, faba beans can get, so they get a brown spot on the leaf, which can hurt yield. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of that up here yet, but we're pretty new to growing faba beans in this area, so um, I'm sure that that's something we're going to have to watch for in the future. Uh, lagus bugs can also be an issue with faba beans. We've seen some damage to our seed over the years from lagus damage, but still trying to get a handle on what the threshold is to spray for those insects. Um, we have sprayed uh, most of our faba beans the last few years with a fungicide of, uh, just to help protect that plant. Um, we've seen in 2015, we definitely saw some advantage to that as some guys had some other diseases that popped up um, that can affect some pulse crops or in the area and so 
having that fungicide application definitely seemed to help save some yield. In regards to weed control, Chris says their faba beans are treated much the same as the field pea crops. So weed control, we're just there's a couple of different products that are on the market. Um, and we're using Viper on ours, um, similar to what you can use on most of your pulse, on your pea crops. And so we've been pretty happy with the control that we get there. We like to try and do a, a pre-seed burn off uh, before we plant the crop to clean the field up and then we'll go in with that with Viper, at, you know, somewhere before the six to seven node stage. As you can see, the Meyerleys are straight cutting this field of Tabor faba beans. Chris says they have swathed faba beans in the past. However, the results were not that desirable. We're happier with a straight cut option. We feel that the, we go in and we desiccate our beans, we use Reglone. And uh, that does a pretty good job of drying the plant down. It's quite a large plant and uh, quite a thick stock. It takes quite a while to dry that down. But uh, we found that once it does get dried down, it goes through the combine quite easily, even though it can be a tall plant, sometimes up to six or six and a half feet tall. And so we're pretty happy with the results of straight cutting. Um, we did swath one year and tried it and found that the swath stayed a little wetter longer and the seed was wetter, or it stayed wetter, damper longer. So it was a little, added a few more challenges to harvesting and, and drying them down. In their experience so far, Chris has found that faba beans may be less prone to cracking when compared with field peas. And so they have, they're a bit easier to handle with an auger or something if you don't have belt conveyors available. Um, they, store, they store quite well. The dry for them is 16% moisture, the same as a pea. And so, um, you know, we, when we take ours off, we've taken them off as wet as 17, 18, 19% moisture and just run some air through them to dry them down. They dry down quite easily. The air, goes, the air flows through them easy. And so they handle well they, and they, they store quite well, no issues there. At the time of our visit, Chris told us that the faba beans had been on average yielding over 50 bushels to the acre, which was putting more dollars in their pockets when compared to peas. In the last couple of years that we've grown them, we've seen anywhere from that $6 to $8 a bushel range on faba beans. Um, and, uh, you know, we've been seeing quite an increase in our yields uh, compared to our yellow peas. Before putting faba beans into the ground, Chris suggests the grower should contract at least a portion of their acreage to ensure the crop has a home come harvest time. 